It's time for some science. Welcome to the Mackie Makerspace. Hi, I'm Brother Bob Mackey. I'm the curator of meteorites at the Vatican Observatory. And I've got something a little different for you today. As you can see, I'm not in my office at the Vatican Observatory. I'm at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona in Tucson. So why am I here? It's because of this little instrument right here. In my day job, I'm not just a meteorite curator. I am also a research scientist. And in that vein, a couple of years ago, I was invited to join the sample analysis team for the OSIRIS-REx space mission. Now that mission sent a probe to the asteroid Bennu and grabbed some material from the surface. And as we speak, that probe is returning to the Earth to deliver its precious cargo. And once the sample container arrives, a whole team of people will be busy performing a bazillion different kinds of analysis on the rocks inside. And I will be one of them. And this device that I have just spent five weeks working on is an ideal gas pycnometer. And it doesn't look like much yet, but ultimately it will be installed in a super clean room at NASA Johnson Space Center. So let me tell you all about it. Oh, but first, gosh, sorry. The air handlers in here are making a lot of noise. So I think I'll do the rest of the audio as a voiceover. Sorry about that. Not much I can do. I've already built some pycnometers, such as this one in my lab at the Vatican Observatory. Oh, hey, look, there's my lab assistant. <laughs> An ideal gas pycnometer measures the volume of a specimen by using the ideal gas law. You put the rock into a chamber of known volume and pump it full of gas and measure the pressure. If the temperature doesn't change, the ideal gas law says that the pressure times the volume stays a constant value. Now open the chamber to a bigger volume. As the gas expands, the pressure drops. But the pressure times volume before and after the expansion remain the same. So this allows us to calculate the volume displaced by the specimen. This is the primary chamber for the pycnometer we've been building. And the specimen goes inside here. By the way, this is just a stand-in while the real one is being machined. The final version will be easier to open and close inside a clean room glove box. And this is the secondary chamber. It's the extra volume that the gas will expand into later. And there are three small chambers here that we can choose from based on the size of the specimen. This part is the pressure transducer. It reads the pressure of the gas in the system and sends the data to the computer. These are solenoid valves. They're computer controlled to open and close, allowing gas to flow. This input valve opens when we do the initial pressurization. These expansion valves open to allow the gas to spread out to greater volume during the expansion phase. And finally, this is the output valve that releases the gas at the end of the measurement. The solenoid valves are connected by wires to these circuit boards. I 3D printed a frame to hold them together, and they will eventually go in their own box. And the boards are in turn connected to the computer. I wrote a control program in LabVIEW to operate the pycnometer, and it reads the pressure every second and opens and closes the valves at the right intervals. It'll also do all the relevant calculations. The graph at the center shows the pressure as a function of time. So let's go through a measurement cycle so you can see how it works. We have the specimen inside. Let's make sure the chamber lid is securely closed. The measurement starts with a click. The program displays which valves are open. Right now, all but the input valve are open, so the pressure in the chamber equilibrates with the outside air. Now we measure the baseline pressure and open the input valve. The pressure rises until it gets to a set amount above baseline when the valve is closed. And give it a little time to settle and record the pressure. Now the expansion valve opens and the pressure drops.
And after that settles, we record the expansion pressure. At this point, we can calculate the volume occupied by the stuff in the chamber. We'll do this several times. In this case, I have programmed a run of five measurements. It's now just about done with the fifth. And once it finishes, it calculates the average and outputs all the data to a file. The sample volume is slightly less than the average of the measurements because there is also some aluminum foil in there to serve as a liner. So I hope you enjoy this little diversion. It's a bit different from my usual content. And I do have to give some credit where credit is due because even though I spent the last five weeks working on this thing, uh, I am not the only one who has had a hand in this. So most of the credit, I think most go to Dr. Andy Ryan, who is the lead for the Sample Physical and Thermal Analysis Working Group, who really spearheaded this particular project, and also for a group of engineering students at the University of Arizona who spent the last year doing some basic design and development of this, and gave me something to work from. So thank you.